Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Nature at School webinar series. Today, you're going to be hearing from our first of our seven new lessons that we made for you this spring. So I'd like to invite Katie Urban to join us. Katie? Hello, everybody. It's a beautiful day today at the park. Um, I'm all the way up in the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park, and I want to talk to you about some of our wildlife in winter. I know some of you guys like wildlife at home. Give me a thumbs up or let me know at home if you do love wildlife just as much as I do. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about um, the park and then we're going to get into the wildlife in the park and how, how people, something like us, right, are getting in and affecting some of our wildlife even in the winter time too, right? All right, so let's go ahead and take a look and we'll see some of the cool stuff we learn about the park. All right. So at home, you should be looking at my blue screen right now. You can see it's very cool. Uh, we're going to be talking about wildlife in winter, right? Very good. So if you've never been here before, the Porcupine Mountains is a beautiful place, right? And all my photos are going to be very winter themed because why not? It's beautiful, right? <laughs> so you can see this is the Lake of the Clouds. It's a very popular spot in the park. Um, this beautiful ridge line here covered in snow. And then right down there, you can see is the Lake of the Clouds. And all the inside of the park here is actually the different trees and the different areas. So as far as you can see here, all the way here to there, that's all Porcupine Mountains. It's a really big place. We have lots of hiking and snowshoeing in the wintertime. We even have a ski hill that you can come if you like to downhill ski or snowboard. And lots of different views and vistas that you can take in while you're here. Lots of rivers and waterfalls. Those 60,000 acres that we have are just full of fun adventures for you to come and have fun with. If you look really hard in this photo, you can even see right here where that little otter has been sliding down on its belly. So it kind of gives you a clue. Some animals are very active in winter, just like our otters. So where is the Porcupine Mountains, right? Hmm, let's take a look. So I don't know where you guys are at in Michigan. Maybe you can find yourself on this map here. But if you look way up here over the Mackinac Bridge, all the way over in the western side of the Upper Peninsula, right here is where we are in the very western side. So Wisconsin's right here. We're pretty far away, right? Depending on where you're at, it could be quite a drive to get here. The Porcupine Mountains is really cool though. Let's zoom in and take a look at it, right? So we took a look, zoomed right in, and you can see this is the boundary of the park here, this kind of green line. And the Porcupine Mountains, it's huge, you guys. From this side here all the way to this side is over 20 miles across. It's very, very neat. And you can see that lake right here, it's not frozen in this picture, but if you were to see it now, it'd be all icy and covered in white snow, right? So it's very cool. But that's that lake of the clouds that I showed you earlier. And if you were to imagine, you have to think of something that's 20 miles, right? Now, you might be a walk to school. You might have to think maybe, you know, it's the distance across, you know, from one side of your town to the other. But if you were to walk that 20 miles through the Porcupine Mountains, it would be going through trees and forests, up and over ridges, down along these hills, through beautiful areas where you wouldn't see very many people or buildings or anything at all, right? Which is kind of cool. Now I have a question for you guys at home, all right? Hmm. So I want to know, all of these beautiful places and these state parks that we have and these state forests, I want to know who do you think owns all of these things? Hmm, you'd have to think about that, right? Who do you think owns? Maybe throw it down, let's think of it at home. I don't know about you, but I'm a partial owner of the state parks. And even one of you guys are partial owners at the state parks, right? So raise your hand, everyone at home, raise your hand. You guys are all partial owners of our state parks, which is really, really cool, right? Now, I don't know if you know this, but not just the state parks and the state forest, right? You own even a little bit more than that which is really neat. Let's take a look. Hmm? So not just those forests, not just the park itself, but you are actually partial owners of all of the things that live on that area too, right? So all the insects and the bugs and the trees and the animals, everything that lives there, you guys are partial owners of, which not a lot of people can say that you own all of these things, right? And the job of the DNR, who I work for, the Department of Natural Resources, is to manage these resources so everybody can share and enjoy them, right? We figure out from you guys what you want to do with these resources and we kind of pool all that information together and figure out how we're going to manage them for you. Now when we're managing our resources and specifically the animals, which are a little bit harder to manage because they move around, right? Trees and stuff, they stay in one spot, but the animals, they move around and they have so many different needs than something like a tree, right? But all living things, animals, plants, everything included, have four things that they need to survive. All living things. Can you think of them at home? Think of some things at home that you might need to survive. Let's see. Hmm, maybe think is something that you gotta eat, 
right? So food, hmm, what else do you need to survive? You gotta think really basic. Let's see, maybe some water? Yes, yep, water. What else do you need? Hmm, I'm in a nice building here. What about you guys? Yeah, are you in a shelter? Yes, so we have food, water, shelter. And the last one, oh, I don't know what it is. Oh, but I love to stretch around and move in mine. What about you guys over there? Yes, <laughs> that's all of your space, right? So just think of it this way. If you had food, water, and shelter, right? And you were in this teeny tiny house, all the food, water, and shelter you could possibly need, but you were only in this teeny tiny little space, you wouldn't be very happy, right? You need the space to move around and stretch and move and live, right? Which is really, really important. So let's take a look here. Food, water, shelter, space. There they are. Food, water, shelter, space. Very good. All right. So let's talk about one of our animals. Hmm. I'm going to show you an animal soon. Here, let me see if you can see my board here. And we're going to go over and talk about the specific needs for one of our animals in the park, a very cool animal that lives here. This is the skull of the animal that I wanted to talk about. Can you guys guess what this animal is? Hmm. Yell it out loud if you think you know. Maybe give you some clues. He's got a really big nose that helps him sniff and smell. He's got large canines and flat grinding teeth that help him grind up all sorts of different plant material. He's got the large canines for hunting still. Hmm, which one of our animals is it? What do you think? Yes, I'm hearing and I'm seeing black bear, right? Very good. So black bears are a really cool animal that loves to live here at the Porcupine Mountain. So let's take a look. What kind of things does a black bear need to eat? The answer is they have lots and lots of different foods that they eat. So black bears can eat things like acorns and nuts. They're a really good source of food for them. They also love blueberries, right? Who else loves blueberries at home? It's one of my favorites. They also eat lots of different types of plants. So this is a dandelion, but they can eat all sorts of different grasses and sedges and things like that. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but black bears love to eat insects, right? They're a great source of protein. Ew, I know it's not very tasty sounding, but there's lots and lots of them and they can find them, right? Now, lastly, black bears do eat meat, right? They're not the best hunters. They really don't want to hunt a whole lot. A lot of times they're eating a lot of these other things just because it's a lot easier, right? They're kind of lazy, but that's okay. If they do happen to find something or they're really hungry, a lot of times they're eating dead animals, but if they happen to come across something that they could hunt, they could eat it. So it's a good source of protein, right? So lots and lots of different things that black bears like to eat, which is really cool. Now let's go on to water. Let's take a look. Let's see what kind of water a black bear could drink, right? He has like something like a pond that he can go and drink in. He would be able to get in the water and sign something like a nice cool river, nice fast flowing. Or, oops, I'm spinning around they can find something like a lake, right? So either an inland lake or a great lake. Bonus points, I wanna hear which one kind of, which one of our great lakes is this great lake here? We'll talk about it here in a little second. Give you a chance to think it over. Hmm, which one is that? It might be superior to all the others. That's right, that's Lake Superior, you guys. So we have all these different sources of water that a bear can get water from. And also he can get water from his food too, right? That's a good part. But if he needed a bigger source of water, he had all this source too. Let's talk about shelter for a bear. Let's see. It could be something as simple as trees for cover, right? Just to kind of get out of the wind or the sun, you know, get some shade, kind of hide a little bit. Or it could be something like a den, right? And I know what you guys are thinking, bears in this big giant cavernous den, and they're all sleeping and snoring and drooling and spitting on each other. But most of the time, black bears, it could be just a simple dugout underneath of a log. And they just kind of like snug underneath of there. Not so big. They don't all sleep together unless it's a mother with cubs, right? Otherwise, they pretty much hang out by themselves. But they do make a den, right? Very cool. And lastly, the one that we had a little harder time with is space, right? So that kind of encompasses all of these things. And for a black bear, that would be something like a forest, right? So all of these things kind of come together in a forest setting. So we have our trees, we have lots of food, a water source, lots and lots of different resources, right? Fantastic. Let's take a look here. I think that would be a very happy bear, right? He's got all the food, the water, shelter, and space he could ever hope for. 
And we have lots of that here at the Porcupine Mountains and probably even places near you too. You can probably think of a lot of these places that a bear would pretty be pretty happy with in your area too, right? Michigan has lots of black bears. But now, uh-oh, I'm thinking of something that happens every year that might mess up some of this stuff. What do you think it is? Hmm, I'm thinking of a season. It might be happening a little bit now. Maybe it's in the tail ends of it where you guys are at. But yes, I'm thinking of winter, right? Uh-oh, <laughs> we've got a winter storm blowing in. Look at that snowing and it's cold and it's blowing around and it comes in and it sticks on here. Uh-oh, you think you're gonna have some of these things in the winter time? Hmm, let's take a look. At home, I want you to give me a thumbs up if you think you've seen some of these things in winter. And I want you to give me a thumbs down if you're like, nope, in the winter time, those are gone, right? Let's take a look. What about acorns? You guys see a lot of acorns in winter? Maybe a few, but not enough for a bear, right? How about something like dandelions and plants? A lot of those? Oh, no, I don't think so either. <laughs> blueberries? You guys go blueberry picking in the winter? No, didn't think so. What about the insects? Oh, they're kind of hard to find too, right? Might be buried under some snow. What about something like squirrels? And meat, oh, a little bit harder, right? Even harder to find now, even in the winter time, right? Boy, oh boy, that's so good, right? So the food sources aren't looking that great. Let's just think and talk about our water. What happens to water in the winter time? Mm -hmm. Might get a little bit cold and it might freeze, right? Something like a pond can freeze completely over. Ooh, right? There's no way you can get some water there. What about like a river? If it doesn't freeze, it might be always flowing, right? So it might still have some water underneath, but if it freezes over top, but otherwise it can be kind of dangerous too, right? And if you're trying to stay warm and you fall in a river trying to get water, uh oh, that can be really dangerous, right? You can be very cold very quickly. So that's kind of gone too. Let's see, thumbs up or thumbs down? Lake Superior or any of our other lakes, our Great Lakes or Inland Lakes, they can get to it, but it can be kind of hard, right? I have to walk a little ways and can be dangerous again too. So our Inland Lakes or our Great Lakes, those are kind of gone too, right? Oh man, so what do we have left? We have our food and our water is gone. So that just leaves shelter and space, right? Hmm, well, what do our bears do in winter? <laughs> What's left over is shelter, right? They go into a den and they do what? Let me hear it at home, what do they do? I think you all know, where they sleep for a long time, yes, they hibernate. So our bears get out and they get into the winter time and they hibernate, mostly because what a lot of our animals that are forced to hibernate do, or forced to migrate, we'll talk about that next, is that they're lacking of food, water, shelter, or space, or a combination of those items, right? Because the snow makes it harder to either get the food in the water or the cold temperatures, right? It's very cold outside, force them to go in and find shelter and be in shelter for a long time, right? Can you imagine if I just picked you up out of your seat and threw you outside right now in the winter? You would have to prepare yourself, right? And that's what a lot of these animals do. Very good, you guys. So we learned a lot about the black bear. Let's talk about some other wildlife. Oh, but first I want to talk about snow, right? So some places we get lots of snow and some places we don't get as much snow, right? I want to show you a video of some snow up here in the Porcupine Mountains. Are you ready? So I'm going to play you a video here and it's going to have a little bit of sound. So you're going to have to be ready to listen. It's pretty neat here. All right, here we go. I'm gonna play you this video about the snow all the way up here in the Porcupine Mountains. All right, I'm gonna show you how deep the snow is. I'm off the trail a little ways, kind of hiked off a little bit in the woods, and I'll give you an idea here. I'm gonna jump off my snowshoes when I'm standing on now into, I'm not sure how deep this is, but we'll find out. All right, here we go. Woo, <laughs> it's pretty deep. I don't know if you can see this. It's, uh-oh, well over my knees here. <laughs> Walking in it, it's kind of hard. So you can imagine an animal trying to walk through this like a deer is going to have uh -oh, a really hard time like I am. <laughs> you can tell. Uh, that's why I wear snowshoes just like some of the animals we're gonna talk about later. Let's check it out. All right, so we have tons of snow. I don't know if that video worked for you, but I'm gonna show you a picture here. 
you can see we have lots and lots of snow here at the Porcupine Mountains. How much snow do you have in your area? Show me with your hands how much snow. Do you have lots and lots and lots and lots of it or not so much, right? So some areas have lots of snow and some areas didn't have so much, right? Maybe your snow's gone. How much did you have at the beginning of the winter, right? So people have lots of different snow and up here we have tons of it. You can see this is one of our buildings with tons of snow stacked on top, right? Which is pretty crazy. So that was another limiting factor, right? So we have the cold, the snow can be also a very hard thing for our animals to deal with, right? All right, so we talked about the bear. Let's talk about what some other animals like to do in the wildlife, right? So when we have wildlife in winter, right? They're gonna do one of four things, or one of two main things originally, right? So wildlife, they can either stay or they're gonna leave, <laughs> okay? Now, if you were a wildlife and you had to live all your life outside and you had to handle winter, what one would you do? Would you wanna stick around in the winter? Do you like it? Or would you be like, no, nope, I'm leaving. I don't wanna stay in outside in the winter all day, right? Which one would you be at home? Yeah, I think me too, right? Staying or leaving. So let's talk about the animals that leave first, right? So let's talk about that. When we call an animal that leaves and is to leave every single year at a seasonal time that they leave and migrate from one area to another, right? We call that migration. They're moving from area to area. When I talk about an animal that leaves in the winter, what's one of the first animals you think of? They're usually the first ones out of here saying, no way I'm gone. That's right. Yep. I'm thinking of birds. Very good. Now I'm gonna test your skills of identifying some birds at home. We're gonna play a little bit of a game. Are you ready? All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a pictures of different birds on it. And we're gonna go through each one. And then while you're at home, I want you to either flap your wings if you think that bird's flying away and not gonna be in Michigan anymore. Or I want you to shiver if you think that bird's gonna stay here and live here even in the winter time, all right? Let's take a look. So you should be looking at my screen now of all these different really cool birds and we'll go through each one. So number one, do you think the American Robin? Do you think it's staying? Do you think you're shivering? Shiver if you think it stays here in the winter or flap your wings if you think it flies away. Have you ever seen one of these before in the winter? That's right, I see lots of flapping. You can see the American Robin, they love to eat something like worms, right? They're always hopping around in the grass eating worms. There's no worms in the winter, right? They gotta fly somewhere where there's worms. Very good. Let's look at our second bird, the ruby-throated hummingbird. Ooh, this is a cool bird, a cool tiny little bird, right? Let's see, what do you guys think? I'm seeing some flying. Yeah, right, they have these long noses that help them get down into the flowers and drink the nectar. There's no flowers in winter, right? Remember the bears couldn't have any of those to eat. So they would be flying somewhere else. They're really good at migrating, right? And flying really far away, those little birds. What about a black cap chickadee? The ones that go chickadee dee dee dee. You guys ever hear that in the winter time? Yeah, me too, right? So you should be shivering. Very good. What about a Canada goose? Hmm? What do you think? Have you ever heard the Canada goose honking in the winter time? No way, right? These are one of the first ones that are honking and flying away. They're doing those big V formations as well before fall. They're like, no way. We want nothing to do with your winter, right? They're out of here. What about a blue jay? Ooh, a big bright blue color in the winter. Do you ever see these mischievous birds causing trouble in winter? Yeah, me too, right? They're always out there making all sorts of noise and trouble. It's very good, they do stick around. What about, now this one's kind of tricky. What about a snowy owl? Ooh, this really cool bright white bird. What do you think? Shiver, is it sticking around or is it flying away or what is it doing? Ooh, I know, I'm sorry, I kind of tricked you a little bit. So snowy owls are actually a bird that actually migrates to Michigan to stay. Isn't that cool? So they actually come here to stay in the winter time, which is awesome. So they're actually usually up in the Arctic area. That's where they live in the winter time or the summertime for them up there. And they migrate down here for winter and come to Michigan. Isn't that cool? So some birds are coming here, which is so neat. Good job, you guys. You've learned a lot about the different birds. You all must be ornithologists at home, which study birds. All right, so another animal that likes to leave, may not just be leaving Michigan, but might just be migrating around, something like white-tailed deer, right? We have lots of these in Michigan. And all the way up here in the Upper Peninsula, we have white-tailed deer that like to migrate around in the area, which is, 
kind of cool, right? If you think about it. So you remember that video I showed you of the super deep snow? So the deer, here's a, video, a picture here of the deer migrating around to get away from the deep snow is basically what they're doing. So we had someone, one of our wildlife biologists took a collar like this and had trapped the deer to figure out where they're migrating from. Now I know there's a lot going on here, but let's just focus on these colored lines here. So the green, the red, and the yellow. And what they did is they tracked the deer as they were moving from areas where there's deep snow to an area where there's less snow. So something like tree cover, like our bear, they're getting into somewhere that has lots of conifer trees. So trees with the cones and the needles that stay on in the winter that have more shelter than the trees that lose all their leaves in the winter, right? And they're migrating pretty long distances to get out of that snow, which is really cool. Now let's take a look at another animal that likes to be, and if you had to be any animal in the winter time, oh, let's talk about, I'm sorry, let's talk about the ones that like to stay first, right? So we talked about the ones that leave, let's talk about ones that stay, right? And if our animals that are staying have to be one of two things, they're either gonna be active or they're gonna do that thing called hibernation that we talked a little bit about, right? So our active animals, one of the best and one of the best brightest ones that stick around is actually something called a ruffed grouse. I know what you're thinking, what in the world is that? If you don't know, it kind of looks like a big brown chicken that hangs out in the woods, but they're really, really good at being, whoops, they're really good at being one of our winter animals because they're so good at adapting, right? So if they're gonna stick around, they have to have some way to adapt or change themselves to maintain themselves in the times where there's no food, less water, and the cold temperatures, right? So they have to adapt to change to make themselves be able to manage their bodies in this area, right? So how would you adapt yourself at home? When you go outside in the wintertime and you're active in the winter, how do you do, what do you do at home to make yourself ready to be outside, right? Do you put on a coat, maybe some gloves, a scarf, a hat? Yeah, right? All those things you need to do at home to stay warm in the winter. And that's what our grouse are doing too. Let's take a look at some of the cool things they do. It's really neat, you guys. Like I said, these are some of the best. So the grouse, just like you put on your big fluffy coat to stay warm, our grouse will make themselves nice and fluffy. They grow extra feathers to keep them nice and warm. You can see, here's a grouse right here. It's very cool, right? And then what's really weird about grouse are they grow these weird kind of wormy projections on their toes that spreads their weight out a little bit more so they can walk on top of the snow. Just like we wear snowshoes, right? Do you guys wear snowshoes at home when you walk in the snow? Yeah, but it's very fun. You should try it if you've never done it before. And what else is really cool about grouse is if I don't know about you guys, but it has been pretty cold here for a few days. And if you've ever walked around outside and had like the snot freeze in your nose, raise your hand if you've ever had that happen to you. Yeah, me too. I don't like it either, right? And it freezes in your nose and it makes the bird really cold on the inside and cools them off really quickly. So what they do, just like how we would manage for that, is we put a scarf around our nose to keep the air and warm it up before we breathe it in. They grow extra feathers up and over their nostrils to warm up the air and keep themselves very warm, which is so cool, right? Another animal that's pretty active in winter is something like, whoop, upside down, <laughs> a pike fish, right? You guys like to fish at home? Raise your hand if you like to fish. Yeah, some of you guys are fishermen, fisher girls out there, right? So we love to fish and pike fish are very predator fish. So they're swimming around. Now fish are cold blooded, right? So they match their body temperatures to the surrounding areas. So when they're in the water and it's really, really cold, they're just really, really cold, right? But that cold weather helps slow them down. They don't use as much energy. They don't use as much oxygen, which is good because if they're living in a lake that freezes completely over, there's no more oxygen getting put into the water. Uh-oh. So we're gonna do something really quick. Are you ready? If you were a pike fish, all right, you have to pretend that you're a pike fish and you're hunting and swimming around and you're looking for prey and you're gonna be hunting, right? But you're a pike fish and you're gonna be hunting. And I'm gonna count to five and you're gonna get up and you're gonna pretend you found something and you're gonna run around and chase it. And you have five seconds. Are you ready? Here we go. Get ready. Go pike fish, go. Swim around, you have five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, come back and sit down. Come back and sit down. Yes, I see a lot of you are taking big breaths, right? So if you're a pike fish and you got around and you were running and swimming really quickly all the time, can you imagine? Oh, you'd be so out of breath. 
and you would use up all of your oxygen, which would be bad, right? So you want to move nice and slow and save your energy and your oxygen because sometimes that's the limiting factor. So we had food, water, shelter, space, but if you're a fish in a frozen lake, oxygen could be a limiting factor too, right? Very good. All right, so we've talked about our active animals. Let's talk about our animals that might hibernate. Now, when I say hibernate, what do you guys think about at home? Hmm? What do you think about? Yeah, yep, something about sleeping. Some people are thinking about slowing down, right? A lot of our animals are pretty good at that. And they might do some form of hibernation, right? So when you're hibernating as an animal, what you're doing is you're bringing down your body temperature, you're breathing down, bringing down your breathing rate, and you're bringing down something called your metabolism, which is basically you turning fat or food into energy, right? And you're slowing all that down to help save that energy resource for a long time. You're trying to stretch it out as long as possible. And the first animal we talked about our black bears are really good at being a hibernator, right? Now let's think about black bears, right? Let's take a look at this picture here. They are so cool, you guys, because they love to go in and their dens and sleep and they hibernate and they can bring their body temperatures down, they slow themselves down and they're stretching their resources until springtime, right? But what's different about black bears compared to a lot of different true hibernators as we would call them, is if I was to reach in there, don't do it. <laughs> I know you want to, but don't do it. If I was to reach in there and poke that bear in the nose, it would wake up right away and come flying out at me and she would chase me, right? You can see her in there with her little cub. She doesn't want me near her cubs, right? So a black bear can wake up just like that. So they're not so far into that hibernation that they won't wake up. Unlike this animal here, like a frog, right? So something like a wood frog or a spring peeper, when they go into hibernation, you can actually pick them up and move them around. Because what they do is they put a certain chemical in their blood that actually lets them freeze themselves without damaging their skin or their cells like how we would do if we were outside. If I was to go stick my arm outside and leave it in the freezer forever, it would slowly, the cells would start to die and we get something called frostbite, right? Which is very bad. But frogs, they can get around that, which is so cool. Another animal, oops, I gotta put my frog up on my board. Another animal that's really good at my hibernation is our bats, right? Let's take a video. One of our last videos here I want to show you guys is a bat hibernating. <gasps> Are you ready? Let's take a look, all right? So we have bats here in the Porcupine Mountains and we're gonna watch a video about them. And it's kind of quiet, so make sure you use your listening ears. I'll turn it up, but I wanna show you about what bats do in the winter time. Let's take a look. It's actually an old mine from copper mining from back in the day. And really no mining going on in a park right now, which is a good thing. But as you can see, it left behind all these big caves, which are perfect spots for bats to hibernate in the winter, because they are true hibernators. So inside the cave here is a little bit warmer than it is outside, so it keeps them from freezing solid like that frog that I showed you earlier. But here you can see we have lots and lots of little brown bats. You see they are hiding upside down little toes. And right now they're kind of in this state where they'll go in where they're hibernating so they're just kind of not moving. Their heart rate's slower. They don't have to eat very much at all, if anything, right? Which is good. And they may wake up a little bit here and there, but for the most part, this is all they're doing. All day. And they're waiting until it warms up outside so all the bugs are back and the temperatures are better. So that's what they're waiting for. It's pretty cool. All right, so bats are super cool, you guys, because they are really good at hibernating, right? So they hang out upside down in those caves, and like the frog that matches its body temperature to the outside conditions and freezes himself because it's super cold out, the bat's doing kind of the same thing, but they're doing it in these giant caves, which are a little bit warmer than if you were to go outside, right? Which is so cool. And same thing with that bat. Don't do it because they don't like it. I could pick him up and move him around for a while, and it'd take him a while to come out of it and be awake, right? My little bat here. So you guys learned about all the different animals here. And one last thing I want to talk about before we can take time, some, take time for some questions is actually about how we as people are affecting our animals, right? So they take hundreds of years to perfect the ways of how they migrate or how they're active in winter or how they even have to go through hibernation, right? And sometimes as people, we 
unfortunately can mess that up a little bit, right? So something like this, which our bats can, is called a white nose syndrome, which is a fungal disease that we accidentally brought on our boots, right? So people all the way over in Europe were hiking and having fun and enjoying and hanging out in caves. They call that spelunking, right? Hanging out in caves. And what they did is they accidentally came all the way back to America and they forgot to clean all their boots off, right? And they brought this fungal disease here and it grows on the bats and it lets them wake up and scratch themselves during hibernation. So they can't go through a full hibernation and they'll actually end up dying from this. And bats are such an important part of our ecosystem because what they do is they love to eat insects, right? They can eat so many mosquitoes and different bugs and moths at night. And that's a huge part of their uh, the ecosystem. And they're just gone now, right? Not, not as many of them, which is very sad. Something like deforestation, right? Could you imagine as a bird that you flew all the way to come from this beautiful area of winter time, coming to a spot where you're gonna hang out for all winter long and it's just gone? Or can you imagine going all the way back home and in the winter time, someone cut down all your houses, right? Can you imagine if you went home right now and your house was just gone? What would you do, right? That's the same thing these birds and these animals are dealing with. And of course we have something like climate change, right? That all the different people are trying to figure out how to deal with right now. It's a huge deal. You can see in this photo here, people are looking at the same spot and 63 years later on the same day, they took another photo and you can see how very different it is, right? There should be all this ice in here and the trees all iced over. And in just 63 years, which seems like a long time to us, but as far as the earth is um, compared to the, the age of the earth, that's not a very long time to have this huge drastic change, right? And all these animals that might needed that ice, it's no longer there, right? So as things like the deforestation and the white nose syndrome that we had with the bats, that's something we've worked on and we're dealing with right now that we're trying to work around. We, don't, we know when we've learned to kind of clean our gear and be better about how we manage and take care of our forests. But something like climate change, that's going to take a while for us to figure out. And that's something that you guys are going to help us figure out too. Well, good job, you guys. You talked about, and we learned about so many different things today, right? We talked about how people affect wildlife. We talked about all the different Michigan animals and how some of the different ones may leave or stay. We talked about those four things that every living thing needs. Do you remember what they are? I'm thinking food, water, shelter, and yes, ace, right? Very good. And we know that who owns all of our state parks is you guys and all the resources that are on that, including all of these animals and plants, right? Well, good job, you guys. If you have any questions, I think we have time for some questions today, Natalie. What do you think? Hi, Katie. That was awesome. I loved learning about wildlife in winter, slumber, and survival. We have three questions today that came up. The first one is, do all black bears need to hibernate? Like even if they're in zoos? Do all black bears need to hibernate? So no, in fact, if the say, if you're in an area where the winter isn't too bad at all, or if you're in a zoo where the winter, or you're just kind of in an area in a zoo where it's not like that cold winter temperatures, um, as long as they have, remember, food, water, shelter, and space, they should be fine, you know? They can be around and active even in the winter time. They don't need to hibernate. They may feel kind of weird at times or kind of like a little bit sleepy or a little more sluggish because they kind of know something's not right. But for the most part, no, they can be pretty active even in the winter time too. Even in Michigan, kind of down where there's not as much snow, right? Kind of I cool. think that's a neat thing to learn. I did not know that. <laughs> uh, second one, what do insects do in the winter? Ooh, what do the insects do in the winter time? So some of the insects actually need the cold in the winter to do different types of metamorphosis, right? So think of like a butterfly turning from a caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly, right? So something like a lot of our different moths that live here, the moths, right? So they have big feathery antennas, big fuzzy bodies. Have you ever seen one of those before? They like to go into a cocoon and some of them need that cold air and temperatures to actually help them change. So some of them need the cold air while other ones just kind of do this weird thing where they just kind of pause, right? So I have an insect here in my hand. This is a Bellostomatidae. It's an aquatic insect, very cool insect. And a lot of our bugs just do this thing where they just kind of freeze and they just don't move. So they'll go kind of find somewhere where they can kind of get down and be out of the snow and the, the very uh, severe elements. And they just kind of pause and we call it diapause. So it's basically someone just went boop and hit pause, just like if you're watching a movie and they're just waiting. Sometimes they might be unfortunate and something might dig them up and find them. 
what? You know, they're waiting for the warm temperatures. Do you ever go on a day where it's really warm outside when you're outside and it's actually snow still around? You might see bugs kind of hopping and flying around. So they're kind of like confused too, kind of waking up. But then they'll go back and as soon as it gets cold again, they'll go find somewhere to hide again. Yeah, they just kind of hit pause waiting for those cold temperatures to be gone. <laughs> I love those bugs. I've seen those in some of our state parks, water, um, water bodies before. Very cool. so, last question, what do trees do? How do they survive winter? How do trees survive winter? So we have our two main different types of trees in Michigan, right? So we have conifers and we have deciduous trees, right? So the conifers are the ones with cones and needles and they're the ones that are gonna be sitting around and they can, they don't drop all their needles, right? Unlike the deciduous trees, think of something like a maple tree, right? And I'm sure in the fall time, who has to rake all their leaves at home? Ugh, me too, right? You gotta rake them all up. So all of your leaves fall off in the winter time so they may do two different things, right? So some are gonna drop the leaves and just kind of go into another pause state, right? Or dormancy as we call for trees, but they all kind of do the same thing, right? So some will drop their leaves, some will keep their needles. And then the needles are smaller and they don't lose as much water, but all trees, they're not gonna be growing, right? So it's kind of cool. You can actually look at our trees and see this is a tree cookie here. And you can see we have rings on a tree. Now, what do we do with those rings? You guys remember? how we can count them, how we can age our trees. So yeah, so if you didn't know, the very tight squished together parts, those rings on there, I don't know if you can see that, that's actually the winter years. And that's where they hang out and they're just not growing. And then in the springtime and the summertime, we have all the sunshine and all the nutrients are back and then they can grow and that's when they grow their leaves back and that's when they're capturing all the sunlight and they're getting nice and full of trees and nutrients and then they can grow a little bit more. So some trees are really fast at growing, have big lines, but those really dark lines is actually where the winter time is. So they're not doing anything, which is kind of cool. <laughs> it makes us easy right. to tell how old the tree is. I like yes, it. which is awesome. Some of our fish species too, um, if you look at it, fish, especially the ones that go through cold temperatures, they can actually pull a scale off and they can do the same thing. Not the best way to age a fish, but you can still do it on fish as well, which is really neat to think about. I loved learning from you today. I hope the audience loved it as well. Join us for another NAS webinar coming up shortly. You can find them at Nature at School. Just Google it or the first link that comes up. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you guys. Have a good day. <laughs>